devices are, are achieving tons and tons of uh, terabytes of pictures, making web, uh, web services with them um, in the public area. So um, I'm almost not doing BSD at work. Uh, I've been an open BSD developer since 10 years, maybe it will be 10 years in next week or something like this. It's been a while. Um, I've been contributing to Mozilla since 2010, 11, more or less uh, six years. And I've also been uh, contributing, developing, helping the sysadmin part of the XFC project since 2006. So as a result, of course, uh, I'm the XFC port maintainer since forever. That's how I got my commit bit in OpenBSD. And I've been the Mozilla port maintainer by accident since uh, six years. <laughs> So uh, for a start, um, you can use OpenBSD as a desktop laptop writing system. It just works. You just use current, you use binary packages, you have all the desktops you want. You have the full-blown desktops, the bloated desktops, and everything. You use the one you want. If you want a small window manager, you can use one. Don't worry about that. You have everything to, from browsers to multimedia, from games. Working, suspend and resume. Uh, so it's a perfect fit for duck fooding if you, just, if you are just used to uh, update your machines and when something breaks, you know how to fix it. Um, speaking a bit wider about Firefox itself, it's been for me the leading web browser in open source software communities for a decade and more. I think I started using it when it was called uh, Phoenix, then Firebird, then Firefox when I was a student. Um, that's not only Firefox, there's also Thunderbird, Simonkey, which is the following of the Mozilla, original Mozilla suit. There was a technology which was called Gzol Runner. There's a huge community compared to the BSD communities we know. Uh, it's something, I would say, 10 times bigger in terms of contributors, in terms of um, engage, engagement in conferences, people uh, trying to uh, do some net, net neutrality politics. There's much more than just the code and the project itself. It's, of course, also a huge infrastructure. Um, Mozilla used to run all its infrastructure in its own data centers. It's now moving more and more to the, to the cloud for uh, business reasons, for cost reasons. As a consequence, at some point, uh, the Mozilla Foundation gave well, I, I, they were trying to get rid of shitloads of uh, Mac minis that were used for building uh, test uh, infrastructure. So we got something like 50 Mac minis in San Francisco. And it's been a funny, funny pair of weeks to be able to distribute all of them to developers in OpenBSD who wanted to have a Mac mini for development. So you, see that, you can see that communities can communicate easily if you know the right persons, if you are involved in both communities. It's also a huge code base. It's freaking insane. In terms of um, lines of code, it's probably 10 times an operating system, I would say. It's, it's a fucking maze. Um, I, I, don't know, I don't know the code itself. Honestly, I'm not good at coding. I'm not good at coding at all. Um, I could say I'm good at fixing bugs and finding where it breaks and how do you manage to build stuff. That's the part where I, can, I could say I'm good at. Uh, they use Mercurial. Um, lots of small, let's say, side projects are developed outside Mercurial. And they are, now have more and more stuff in GitHub. So there are lots of techniques to import stuff from GitHub to Mercurial. And you have things in both ways. And um, it's a full-time job to keep up with that. So I can't, of course. Um, since Firefox 4, there's a f that what's called the fast re release schedule, which is modeled after what uh, Chromium did. Uh, so it was around 2011. There's a new release every six weeks, um, which means there are no big features every six weeks, but you get a new real version every six weeks. And it's supposed to be totally seamless for the end user. You are not, not supposed to notice anything user visible. Well. It, it, works, it works most of the time. Uh, the supported platforms by upstream are, of course, the main platforms. Windows for like 95% of the user base, uh, maybe uh, macOS for four, five, maybe 10%. I don't really know the last numbers. There are plenty of numbers on uh, metrics.mozilla.org, I think, on the, user, the, user, the installed user base, and probably like one to 5% for Linux. And of course, we have no idea for the others. 
us, hello. Um, and of course, it's mostly support only on i386, AMD64, like the platforms that people actually can buy in the market and use as laptops. ARM is support way more than before. Uh, of course, I forgot about it, but Android is a supported platform. On ARM, um, on ARM, on recent ARMs, like if you have a smartphone which is um, two years old, like this poor ship which was 60 uh, euros, uh, you can't install the latest version because the instruction set of ARM has been considered as deprecated, so you need a newer smartphone. The same thing for tablets. I have a Galaxy Tab from 2011, and I can't install anything more recent than Firefox 35 or 40 something. Um, people have been thinking it's Mozilla is dying. Yeah, it's the same thing. The BSDs are dying. Everything is dying. But there are still people working on it. Lots of people. Um, there's been two or three years during when the Mozilla Foundation developed Firefox OS, which shifted a lot of interests compared to before, where they were. Okay, so I'm going to yell a bit louder. Um, I was saying that uh, uh, during two or three years, the Mozilla Foundation tried to develop Firefox OS on the same code base, which was full of nice ideas. Uh, in the end, uh, the market didn't reply correct, totally positively, so it was a fail, but they learned lots of interesting things from this. So it was a loss of um, money, probably. Uh, they, I, they had hired something like 600 engineers in Taiwan, which had to be moved elsewhere. So for the code base itself, it has been quite a disruption for two or three years because there were shitloads of code for what, they call, what was called boot to gecko in code terms that could disrupt what was happening for Firefox for desktop. So it was an interesting uh, journey too. So yeah, the browser wars. Um, uh, historically, uh, of course, Internet Explorer was the main browser, everyone, uh, not speaking only about the BSDs, but Firefox won the browser war around 2000 something, and then Chromium arrived, and then Google poured shitloads of money into Chrome, which is fine. Um, I won't enter into politics, but the fact that some Google applications work much nicer on Chromium because it's a, it's a first, uh, it's the main target platform because most of the people are using it, don't help the other browsers. And you can think that right now in 2017, I think Firefox has a market share of 15 to 20%, let's say, when it was around 40, 50% uh, five or six years ago. Um, in the end, it's, it all matters the choice you want to do as a user. Um, if you care about having sane defaults, if you care about the politics behind what Mozilla is doing, behind what Chromium is doing with your user data, uh, it depends who you trust. If you are trusting more Mozilla or Google, if you trust nobody, then, uh, well, you can use links or NetSurf. There are plenty of choices. You don't have to use them, but if you want to do some serious uh, full-blown JavaScript applications, you don't really have the choice. And it's a matter of habits. Um, lots of people have, have been putting graphs about, yeah, Chromium consumes less, Firefox consumes less resources. Honestly, it's only metrics, and it really depends on lots of factors that I have no idea. You can, you can use the numbers the way you want. In the end, it all matters. You can just use the, the one you want. So back to 2010. Um, we, were, we were on OpenBSD 4.6. There was a complicated trans transition between Firefox 3 and Firefox 3.5 and 3.6, and Firefox 4 was coming. Um, and the current maintainer wasn't replying to my emails about updating them. He wasn't very responsive at that time. He, I think he didn't have much time. So I started looking as an interesting challenge, like, okay, I can maybe update to Firefox 4 as I got interested in the, yeah, the fast, the new fast schedule, fast release schedule looks interesting. And it got me into the rabbit's hole for the years since then. At that time, uh, Firefox was working perfectly fine on Mac PPC and Spark 64. It was building too on Alpha. Um, I don't remember if I ran it on Alpha on a, like a console screen, like the real, the real glass, uh, glass screen. Um, it, you could see that the code base was aged. Uh, it was working, but GMake and Auto L everywhere. So that's, yeah, okay, people think it's horrible. But at still, we know how to uh, understand it and hack it. That was not so bad. We were able to build it with a system toolchain, which was at that time um, 
probably GCC4 and GCC3 on some platforms, but we had to use GCC4 because uh, it was C++ from 2010, which was requiring some stuff which weren't present in GCC3. Um, there was J the Java plugin, of course, coming from the an old GT GDK 1.5. There were lots of other plugins, uh, NP API, which is the way um, Gecko engine allows plugins to interact with the browsers for Java, for, for having a terminal in a tab, which is uh, funny, quite uh, useless, for media playing outside of the browser, there was, there was Gecko media plugin. Uh, in the port, there was something like, I'm only talking about Firefox because there was more or less the same thing in Simonkey and Thunderbird. Uh, there was around 80 to 100 patches for lots of things without comments, without, uh, I only had the CVS log, honestly. Um, Xel itself was the toolkit uh, Mozilla was promoting to uh, build the graphical interface of the browser, which is everything which is outside the browser window, well, I mean the, the web page, is, was built around Xel, and Xel Runner was the runtime to be able to build applications using this toolkit. Uh, it was still used a lot in 2010, and of course there was Thunderbird 2, Simonkey 1.2, uh, seven something which was more or less the Mozilla suite uh, still building but without new features for people who are used to the old interface it's still available of course um, in 2013 after yeah three years of nice work um, I managed to remove well to upstream all the patches most of the patches we had I got involved in the Mozilla community um, to build the ports, everything which was common was uh, centralized in a module uh, for the port 3, which allowed me to uh, do lots of cleanup and only have the important thing for M Firefox and Thunderbird separately in their own make files. Um, we were already building with uh, CLang or GCC 4.6, depending on the platform, since Firefox 6.17 because I think at that point it was requiring uh, some features from C++ which weren't available in uh, GCC 4.2 that we, are, we were still using uh, in the base system. Uh, HTML video and audio was working quite nice. At that time, uh, they had imported the libav codex uh, libraries to decode the video and uh, audio. WebGL was working, uh, depending on your graphical chipset and if you had OpenGL working, um, it was working quite nice. Uh, there wasn't a port for the ESR line, which uh, was created with Firefox 10, I think, because people were complaining that, okay, there's a release every six weeks, but it's moving too fast and it's breaking your, our user flow, so you need to provide a long-term support release, so there's a, there was a new branch, but there wasn't a port for it because I was considering um, in the end, it wasn't work, not that much work, but I was considering it not that interesting that if you want Firefox, you just use Firefox. I don't want to maintain another separate copy of, uh, of Firefox. And I think at that time in 2013, uh, I already got a commit access uh, at Mozilla because uh, most of the developers, I was reporting all our patches through the bugzilla. And after a while, they got really pissed at me because I was keeping creating bugs and pushing back patches. And in the end, it was, more, okay, yeah, we'll give you your access and you'll commit your stuff, which is, in the end, more or less what happens in the BSD communities too. If you harass the developers enough with patches, <laughs> at some point, you get blamed and you get uh, commit access. So um, that was interesting at that time because I had to learn uh, Mercurial, of course. Well, coming from CVS, it was nice. Uh, which is nice because with all the projects I've been uh, working outside of OpenBSD, I've been, uh, I had to use Git, SVN, Mercurial, I think I, 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 I had to use most of the VCS uh, available. And um, that gives you a different view on the way communities work, the tools they are using. Uh, Mozilla is writing a lot. Well, everything happens through Bugzilla. If you want to change a comma somewhere, you have to file a bug which can be considered tedious, but at least everything is tracked and you can trace back a change to whoever did it, with whoever reviewed it, and why was it committed, which is a process which is quite interesting compared to what we can be used to see uh, in the BSDs. And right now, uh, four years later, 
Uh, WebGL is still sort of working. The fact the, the only issue is my laptop or work desktop or home desktop only have all graphic cards, so it's not working for me, but I know it's working for people who have recent hardware. Uh, JavaScript is not, so, not, that fast, not that fast, which can be an issue because more and more stuff are relying on JavaScript all the time. Uh, lots of bits of the graphical interface are being written, well, they were written with XUL and they are now written with JavaScript. So parts of the user interface are in JavaScript. So if you need an efficient JavaScript engine, WebRTC, uh, which is the technology behind uh, interpersonal communications, audio, video communications, like Skype, but in your browser, uh, the code which is in uh, Mozilla is shared with Chromium, more or less, and uh, when it was imported in Mozilla, it was quite funny while of uh, patching, figuring out the build system, which wasn't at all the Mozilla build system, which was integrated partly in the Mozilla build system, but still using the GIP or that I didn't really want to uh, know uh, how it worked. That was quite painful, but um, right now, I haven't tested it since maybe a year, but you can... Uh, Use, you can try using WebRTC on Firefox, on OpenBSD. It will, uh, uh, you can try, there are lots of websites using this technology. You can share your, your microphone with it. You can share your webcam with it. It might work, but don't trust me on this. Uh, you can enable uh, the multi-process feature of uh, Firefox, which is something that has been uh, asked for a long time by uh, users because Chromium added and it allowed them to separate resources from the content process, from the UI process. Uh, it's Mozilla start, tried to develop this for Firefox 4 and then totally gave up because it was, uh, they had imported the inter-process uh, communication framework from Chromium and it, it was totally uh, abandoned after a while and uh, it became something that there was more interest in it maybe uh, one or two years ago again. So it's working on OpenBSD. You can have it, it by, uh, you can check if it's working for you by going to about support and you have the, some uh, line which says multi-process windows enabled or not or disabled by default, or you can force enable it. I still have to figure out uh, what's need, what needs to be done so that it's uh, enabled by default without doing anything because most of the time uh, it's enabled by default only on the tested platforms. We are not a tested platform, of course. Uh, in the port tree right now, we have uh, what, I call, what I call the mainline Firefox, which is 55.0.3. Uh, 56 is around the corner. It will be released like next uh, Tuesday or Wednesday. So it's at ARC3. There's a port for Firefox ESR, which is right now 52. 57 will be released in November, which will be a bit too late for uh, OpenDSD 6.2. So I'll come back a bit on that later. Um, an external contributor made a port for uh, the Tor browser bundle, which is a modified version of ESR uh, build, bundling Tor and some uh, Firefox extensions to use HTTPS everywhere. Uh, no script is enabled by default, uh, and everything is integrated correctly in the, in the modified Firefox version. So you um, you can use the Tor browser bundle on OpenBSD. It should work straight. It should work uh, without doing anything. I was a bit reluctant to import it because um, as a Mozilla contributor since some years, uh, I've only, I've often had, uh, considered the Tor browser developers as a hostile fork because um, they didn't try that much to contribute back all the security and privacy patches they were doing into our browser bundle. It, it was the case uh, two years ago because the Tor browser developers themselves consider themselves way smarter than the Mozilla developers. Um, I'm not smart enough to understand all the details, but I know it improved a lot in the last year because right now the Tor browser developers are feeding back way more patches than before upstream. So uh, in, in the end, uh, the things really improved. And uh, I think we imported the port uh, last year and the, the OpenBSD contributor who did this port uh, spent shitloads of hours and builds and he was always pushing the, the port and after a while it's okay he spent so much time working on this i can't let this port outside of the port tree uh, just to reward him of all the work he spent on it for like it, he's been uh, working on the port two years outside of the port tree which is uh, insane dedication um Xol itself so the toolkit 
which is which is was used to uh, create the graphical interface is more or less dead. I removed the Xolvener port one month ago. It was a good moment because it was a Xolvener 24, which was unmaintained for like maybe four or five years. Uh, Thunderbird itself is still alive. Uh, sadly, it's it got cut off the Mozilla Foundation. They are trying to get rid of the community which is developing uh, Thunderbird because uh, they are saying it uh, prevents Firefox from some innovations. So the Thunderbird developers, which are not that much, are trying to struggle to uh, keep up with Firefox ESR. Um, after all, in 2017, there are less and less people using a full-blown mail client. Lots of people are using web mails. So is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't really know. But Thunderbird is still alive. I'm using it um, at work. Um, the NP API uh, part of the Gecko engine is disappearing. It will be removed in Firefox uh, 57. To, to, let, to let place to what's called the web extensions, which is something which, is, which should be shared with Chromium, uh, which changes the way uh, plugins are allowed to modify the interface. And it's, um, it's meant as preventing, uh, well, let's say, um, security issues coming from the plugins. Uh, everything is separated in a different process and the web extension doesn't have access to lots of internal workings of the browser, which led to several security issues in the past. So um, lots of people have been complaining about that because lots of previous extensions, add-ons, aren't uh, ported to the new web extension framework. So lots of people are complaining, okay, I'm going to stop using Firefox because this extension won't work in, uh, in Firefox uh, 57. It's a matter of time for the, for the add-on developers to uh, port their code. Uh, most of the main, mainly used uh, add-ons are ported to the new framework, so it, uh, it works for most of the cases, but there are only people who are we are always people who are complaining about lots of things. And of course, right now, um, Firefox on OpenBSD only runs on ND64, and it struggles on i386. I still have a Natom netbook with one gigabyte of RAM, which is eight years old. I can start Firefox on it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's very sad because I used, I've only used uh, Firefox on all my, my machines. And seeing it struggle, uh, I think before seeing a window, it's like 30 seconds, maybe one minute. Once it started, it sort of works, but you don't want to run uh, full-blown JavaScript. You don't go to Google Maps. <laughs> uh, only if you like pain. And it's, it's a sad state. Um, I gave up on the other platforms. More on that later. And now um, for the build uh, part. So as we only have two uh, supported platforms on OpenBSD, I can build everything with Silang. Uh, we have Silang in the base system, but um, uh, we are using the base system uh, compiler on MD64, and I think it's Silang from ports on i386. The GMAC auto conf, auto make, auto hell uh, build system, which was working fine, but working fine to my uh, standards. For Mozilla, it wasn't good enough because they couldn't parallelize lots of parts of the build system, so it was replaced by their own grown build system? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? I don't really know. Uh, the guys who are developing MASH, which is uh, do in uh, German, and the most build, which is the equivalent of Makefile, the guys who are developing it are really, really smart guys. So I, lo I read lots of blog posts from them about all the ideas behind this build system. I'm not smart enough to understand lots of things. But as a port maintainer, it's okay. I just have to learn a different build system. Why not? I've seen Oros. I've seen lots of Python build system. I won't mention them because I'm going to, be, to get crazy. But this one is also written in Python and it's not so bad. The most build files are more or less declarative and um, it's not that bad. Uh, Firefox art depends on the Rust language since Firefox uh, 53. I'll come back to Rust uh, later. 
Uh, we switched to a GTK3 um, for OpenBSD 6.1. I think it was more or less at the same time that Upstream decided to switch from GTK2 to GTK3. Um, I think we were the, f the first one to enable it by default uh, in the Linux BSD distributions. I had been using it for some uh, releases before it's been made default upstream. It was working not that bad and lots of people wanted, wanted to get rid of the GTK2 parts. It relies on ICU for the internalization parts and sometimes you can build with the system-wide ICU. Sometimes you have to build the bundled ICU. Same thing for unspell for the spelling. Sometimes uh, the version you have in the port tree is enough. Sometimes you need to use the version which is in the source tree of Firefox. Firefox, of course, bundles SQLite free. So sometimes you can use the system-wide one. Sometimes you use the internal one. And NSS and NSPR, which are relics from the past, are still used a lot. And it's the same thing. They are developed by Mozilla as external projects, which are imported in the Firefox tree. And of course, when there's a new NSS or NSPR release, the Firefox build system says, hey, I want this last NSS and NSPR version. NSS is used mostly for the, all the TLS, uh, SSL certificate stuff. And NSPR was the portable library, but I still don't know why it's still here, because lots of people at Mozilla want to rip it for lots of reasons. I think it's been developed since 20 years. Um, it's still uh, a struggle. Um, I had funny issues with uh, Rust code, because of course there's more and more Rust code in the Gecko engine, and uh, Rust is working on OpenBSD on i386, but sometimes with the default uh, options, it blows when building, so of course on i386 you only had three uh, gigabytes of memory or something, so it leads to funny issues. Uh, the JIT engine is sort of funny too, because they want to have their own memory management. So at start, I think it was around Firefox 54 something, uh, the JavaScript engine allocates one gigabyte of memory, that's all, and then does its own memory management inside it which is quite funny when you have all, all the security measures provided by the operating system memory management that you don't want to use because you are smarter than the operating system. I'm not sure it's always a wise idea. And of course, on OpenBSD, as a default user, you can only allocate 70, 68 meg megabytes of memory for a process. So you start Firefox and it blows. That happened a lot. So you just have to patch it and some of the Mozilla developers working on the JavaScript engine are very friendly about the third parties and they are open to discussions. They are very smart. I am not smart enough to explain them. Okay, we have those limits. Why are you doing this? And I'm trying to make people talk to each other. And it's, um, it's not that easy because often it's okay, those guys are crazy. They are doing silly things. They shouldn't do this. Okay, I, I can tell them, but I can, I can only tell them this. I'm not able to explain them why or... So it's, I'm not able to fix that kind of thing. You can only patch it and say, okay, just allocate reasonable amount and then allocate more if you need more. That's most of the problems I have those days for building or for running, you get uh, memory explosions when you run heavy JavaScript. This part, I mean, in my opinion, is the, the, the part where we'll have the most problems in the, in the future, the JavaScript engine. So, oh, I mean, working daily, well, not daily, uh, on the Mozilla's. Uh, for years, I've been using bare metal machines. I had an i386 and an MD64 machine, a Spark 64 machine, hosted at various places, thanks to lots of generous donators. I think I used four, five, six, eight different machines over uh, six years. And last year, I moved to uh, use Proxmox on a single machine. Uh, guys from Po in the south of France lent me a machine with 64 cores. And I put OpenBSD and D64 on it, and it was totally useless because the CPUs and the kernel were ping-ponging tasks all the time. In the end, you just put uh, Proxmox, you have KVM, VMs. I can have VMs for stable, for current, for A86, for 64 bits. And in the end, you, uh, if you build on a KVM VM for Firefox, it should be around 
on this machine, it should be around two hours. And if I was trying to build it on the bare metal machine, it was something about three to four hours, which says a lot about multiprocess performance for OpenBSD. Um, I've been using BuildBot since years. Uh, Mozilla was originally using BuildBot 2 for all the internal uh, CI uh, stuff. They are moving to something called Task Cluster, which, have be, which, which I think have been developed by Mozilla for Mozilla to distribute tasks on the cloud, mostly uh, AWS. Um, everything, of course, everything is, is public. So you can see the, the links I won't show you right now. And I'm, um, I'm building the Mozilla Central, which is the trunk, and Mozilla Beta, which is the beta branch, every night with uh, the trunk, and that produces a package, not a, an OpenBSD package, that's a, mo that's a tarball with the binaries in it that you can just untar and run Firefox from it. And I, of course, build, package, sign, and distribute the released betas. Like, for Firefox release, there will be something between 10 to 12 betas released every week or every three or four days. And I package them as an OpenBSD package, and I distribute them on a separate package repository. I sign the packages so that you can know that, okay, it, those packages come from Landry. And that allows me to uh, use betas on my machines so that I can dog food what's going to happen in the next versions. I encourage people to use those betas. After all, if it's in beta, it's not that experimental than what's in Nightly, which can be quite funny. And I manage the port and the different branches in Git repositories outside of the ports tree, and I only commit to the ports tree in the CVS when there's the released version so that I know that I've tested it enough and I can uh, distribute it to uh, users. And it's working quite fine since... Uh, since those six, six or seven years, I think uh, we have the Firefox update in the ports tree, like in the next, uh, in the tr three or four hours after it's released upstream. And of course, it often happens that you have a .0.1 and a .0.2 version released some days after the main release. So you get that into the ports tree. That, that gave me lots and lots of free commits to the OpenBSD ports tree, of course. Um, I try to track the CVS files in my Git repository so that I can track which patches um, are temporary in my workflow and the ones that I will have to commit to CVS. Um, when I started, there were lots and lots of patches. Right now, they are almost none, and I'm trying hard to avoid committing patches to CVS because that means I would have failed in uh, pushing back a patch in 12 weeks since uh, I know every day if Nightly is building or not. And I know every day if beta is building or not, which means when the build bot is read, I have to go look at it and figure out if uh, I need to fix something. So maybe let's just see one second. Oh, fuck. Okay, I don't have net, so we, we won't see. <laughs> Forget about that. Um, I try to explain most of this workflow and toolchain in an undeadly article. The slides will probably be available. I used to do slides in a web page, and I found it funnier to do uh, slides in a presentation in a terminal for someone working on web browsers. It's, it says a lot. I have special uses for web browsers. Uh, what's my workflow when I, there's a new upstream release? I get a mail every day telling me if there's a new version. Just have one line to change the make file. Eventually adjust dependencies if something doesn't build with the version of SQLite we have in the ports tree or NSPR, that kind of thing. Just grab the new source table, apply patches, update patches if it's needed, update the plist if there are new files in the package, which happens almost never. Package it. Upload it to my private server where the package is signed and distributed. It and distributed. I commit my work to my Git repo, which is also public, and then uh, people can just use the beta on their laptops. They just have, if they res if they use m uh, my package repository in their uh, environment in the package path variable, they can just update and use the new beta version. And I try to package most of them when I'm around the computer.
so yeah, more on buildbots. What 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 it's doing? Um, every day it's building, and I don't have anything to do. I just have to look at it from time to time. Uh, I only follow the RSS feed from the buildbot to see if it's red or green. Um, most of the time it's working. The trunk has been building without patches most of the time since 2012. And it's building the default configuration, the default upstream configuration. Uh, so when something gets enabled by default, you can see that it breaks quite fast for you because uh, everyone forgot about what wasn't in the supported platforms. It's building uh, on OpenBSD MD64 F86, FreeBSD MD64, uh, Flow is providing me a BI VM for that, and I'm not doing anything on it, so sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I don't uh, maintain this slave. I just have access to it to uh, check the dependencies, but other than that, I'm not doing anything. It's also building most of the time on FreeBSD, and it provides what's called the Mozilla package that you can use to test for regressions. If you know that uh, some feature was working in the nightly build from yesterday and not, no, it's not, it's not working, you can grab the different binaries. Of course, on OpenBSD, the binaries are dependent on the libraries that were on the system on the build slave at that moment. But I try to update the build slave every time there's a new OpenBSD snapshot. So if you are using current, you can use a current package of Mozilla on your OpenBSD current. I don't know of lots of people doing this. But that provides everything needed to people who want to test for runtime regressions for what's the default Mozilla configuration. So now a bit more about the relationship we have with upstream. They know we are here, at least for FreeBSD and OpenBSD, because we are two developers active a lot in Bugzilla. Uh, Jan Beige from FreeBSD has been doing a lot recently. I've been doing way less than before. I had way less time for this. So uh, he took the, the job I had before of uh, reporting a stream that stuff we are building. Um, he's doing more, patch more patching than before than me. And as I've been uh, in this community since six, seven years, I know lots of the Mozilla developers. I know where they are working, in which area of the code they are working. I know who to ask for hints or reviews. Being on the, IRC, on the Mozilla IRC helps. Uh, I've met lots of them. Uh, live in Toronto in uh, the Mozilla office uh, yesterday, uh, two, days, two days ago in FOSDEM in different conferences. And it's always nice so that they know, okay, yeah, okay, you are here, you are the BSDs and you can put a face on a name and okay, we are going to, be, to try to be nice with you. Of course, we are not a priority platform and it was true some years ago, they knew, really knew that we were here and they were trying to uh, ask me for feedback on patches that they knew were going to land and might possibly break us. Uh, it's a bit less true now because I've been less involved and you get lots of, and lots of bugs because some of the new Mozilla developers don't know that people are using uh, Mozilla outside the tier one supported in, uh, operating systems. So you often get a build failure because uh, we don't have the uh, SPS profiler, which is some feature that would have to be written from scratch for the BSDs. And lots of people build uh, write code that rely on this feature and you get a new build feature and okay, it's always the same thing. That's a bit uh, sad. Um, Upstream is really welcoming contributions from uh, outsiders. Um, as long as you provide, as when you are reporting a bug, to your favorite BSD, you have to provide details. I was doing this, it doesn't build since this change. You need to learn a bit about all the mechanics bit behind the Mozilla community and the tools they are using to, be set, to bisect and where to look in the code. This change broke me and I have to come back to the bug that was, that was where the discussion happened on this change. And you file a new bug that says, okay, I'm blocking the, this bug because uh, since then I'm my, the build on my platform is broken. After a while, you really get used to it. At the beginning, it's, uh, it's quite hard to figure out how this community works, but in the end, it's very interesting because you see the, di the differences in the, the workflows between the different projects and depends a lot on the project size, of course. Um, if you are an OpenBSD user and you have a bug on Firefox, 
Maybe it's not OpenBSD specific. Well, if it's something like memory exhaustion or it's probably OpenBSD specific with the limits we have, but most of the time I'm not able to deal with it because I have no special knowledge in the code, but I can tell you who to ask, file a bug, get involved in a community that will help me, of course. Um, most of the time I'm only dealing with build system uh, issues, which is the easy part for me. So, on a different topic, something I started um, this year, uh, since I moved to uh, KVM VMs on Proxmox, and there's, that's something that's been discussed a lot in OpenBSD about providing updated fixed packages for the stable versions of OpenBSD. It's been discussed a lot. It happened for a while. Uh, it's been provided by uh, M tier, which is a separate company for a while, for some packages, which were mostly the server packages. And I figured out, okay, but people are using, uh, some people are using OpenBSD on their desktop. They want to use stable for reasons. Why not? And it means that uh, when you are using stable, uh, you are just using the, the version which was, in, uh, which was in the release when it was cut which means after six weeks, you are not using a supported release upstream. You uh, might be vulnerable to uh, lots of problems. So I started working on uh, the stable VMs to backport what's in current to uh, the port tree in the stable branch. And of course, it's not enough because if you commit to CVS, people have to build their own package. So the KVM VMs allow me to package the updated versions, which means that if you are using 6.1, and you use uh, the repository pointing to the 6.1 subdirectory, of course, you can have Firefox 55.0.3. And when 6.1 uh, when was released with Firefox 53 something, I don't remember, maybe it was 48. And in the last uh, months, I got some users. The numbers are interesting because it shows that almost nobody is actually using i386. Um, it's not that much, so I don't know if people are not trusting the packages I'm providing, if it's too complicated to uh, use them. Um, I don't really know what to do about, about it, but I think it's nicer to users to provide them stable packages so that they can directly install them on their, on their machines instead of having to build them. And for beta packages, it allowed me to see that some people are actually using the beta packages. So yeah, the topic about portability. Um, I gave up on PowerPC and Spark 64 a long time ago. Uh, Netf NetSurf is a perfectly fine browser which was developed for RiskOS, which is insanely portable to lots of platforms. It works perfectly, perfectly fine on PowerPC. If you are still using a PowerPC laptop or Spark 64 machine, I gave up on this. Martin Newsman, who is here, is doing an insane job as at trying to have NetBSD, Spark 64, still having a working Firefox, and I thank him for that because he knows lots of stuff about Spark 64. I know close to nothing about Spark 64 specifics. You have NDNS issues, you have the unaligned access in the JavaScript engine. You don't want to know about these horrors. And a bit now about the future, I will try to go fast on this, the five minutes. Rust is the future for Mozilla. They developed the language themselves. It has some popularity outside of Mozilla. On Stack Overflow, I think there's, I saw uh, numbers about developers using this language for lots of other things. It's taking uh, momentum. I think it took some momentum to the Go language. There, of course, there are lots of new shiny languages, Swift, Elm, everything. Uh, like every new language, you have to have your own package manager, which is called Cargo, which was a different port, which is now inside Rust. The Rust port has been maintained by, by Samari, Sebastian Marie, who is doing an inside job at it. I thank him a lot for that, because you have, of course, as a language, you have to bootstrap it. So he managed to bootstrap it from Linux MD64 to OpenBSD MD64, going through crazy hoops and loops. Uh, as uh, it's developed by Mozilla, they are releasing a new version of the language every six weeks. And there's something called RustUp to update the language compiler itself, which is, of course, an issue for OpenBSD as uh, 
the binaries are provided by a third party and you can't be sure that they will run on your machine because of the library dependencies, the IBA, everything. And as uh, Firefox, uh, Rust language, language itself is supported on mostly the main, main platforms, Windows, Linux, ARM, Android, uh, uh, Mac OS, and OpenBSD is far from tier one. I know FreeBSD and NetBSD are tier two because they are providing uh, Rust up binaries. Upstream is providing Rust up binaries because they are not the same uh, ABI issues that we have on OpenBSD. And parts of the Mozilla code base are being slowly rewritten using Rust, which allows uh, upstream to remove lots of parts of old code, which is here since the 90s. There's been a recent policy about making Firefox build system depend on the recent version of Rust, which can be a problem. Um, once I had the Mozilla Nightly trunk failing to build because it was requiring Rust, the version of Rust, which was released upstream the last day, which is a bit short to have someone update the language on your operating system. Uh, outside of Gecko, Mozilla has been developing Servo, which was a research project to build the web engine from scratch, massively parallel, everything in Rust. And now there's a, what they call the Canton project, which is to migrate features, features by features from the Servo, Gecko, uh, from the Servo engine to Gecko inside Firefox. So uh, there are four main parts, and Stilo is the CSS engine written in Rust, which is supposed to replace the CSS engine uh, which is in Gecko, and that will happen by default for Firefox uh, 57, which is not that far away, so it means lots of testing in the coming beta cycle. And for OpenBSD, um, what's Firefox future on OpenBSD? Uh, as I said, I gave up totally on the other architectures. I'm sorry for the ones who are using Spark 64 or PowerPC. I just can't deal with that. It's too much pain. I'm not smart enough to understand the specifics of the platforms. Um, upstream in, is more and more reluctant to allow you to fix the wrong NDNS platforms because it's lots of changes to push back upstream. The next hurdle is to have uh, Stylo working on i386 because uh, by default the, CS, the Rust code in Firefox is built with all the big information which of course explodes the memory limits that you have when you are building on i386. The next prob problem for me will be to uh, enable the multi-process features. It's working on OpenBSD. Right now we have one content process by default. Uh, Upstream is planning to move to four content projects to move the network communications to a separate process, to move the GPU communication to a separate process, to have a local file system access in a separate process for the sake of course of security and sandboxing, which means you need efficient IPC. Um, on OpenBSD it's working. I don't know if it's efficient. Sometimes uh, you get a real slowness in the browser. I need to look at sandboxing for Firefox uh, 57, uh, 57. It will be touted as the version with, where everything is sandboxed on the main maintained major platforms. So need to catch up with that and figure out how you can pledge the different processes. But first, you need to have by default working and uh, reliable multi-process in Firefox. Need to figure out if I need to push the default limits to something bigger. I need same open. Recently, I had to do a hack to use a Mac OS code path because some feature was relying on same open. Then, for some reason, we don't have shared semaphore on OpenBSD. Or I have to bribe Tedu to uh, write the feature in the kernel itself if it's not considered security sensitive. And yeah, of course, the generally the stuff that gets enabled by default in the build gets me in trouble lots of, uh, most of the time. I need to keep Rust working. If something happens, happens to Sebastian and he's not able to uh, maintain Rust, I'm stuck with the Firefox version that will require the Rust version I have. There's of course the, of course the Rust ABI target issues. Um, Jean-Sébastien Dumbbell from FreeBSD is working with Sebastian with that on trying to push back upstream the idea of, okay, you provide binaries, but you need to provide binaries for different ABIs, FreeBSD 11, FreeBSD 12. For OpenBSD, we don't, uh, we don't, we, we don't tr uh, say that the ABI is stable for every release. So that means providing binaries for every release. There's discussion in trying to have that kind of switch happen at runtime, which will solve the problem for everyone. 
but that has to be pushed back upstream. WebRTC needs testing because I think it's an interesting technology in itself, allowing lots of people to use uh, video, audio, intercommunications without relying on Skype or having Linux running something for Skype or that kind of horrors. Uh, ARM64 might happen someday. I know uh, Peter Hester was doing ARM64 package builds. We'll look at all that's needed to have Gecko building on ARM64, but that means you need Rust. That means you need lots of other bits, uh, but most of the code itself should be here as ARM64 is supported on Linux. Why not on OpenBSD? Uh, that's lots of ideas for the future. I have way less time than before. I'm, I have less motivation, to be honest. So I'm still looking for help. If people want to get involved in Mozilla, in OpenBSD, I welcome help, but you just need to get used to uh, the tool chains, the different ways of building it. But I think most of the stuff I'm doing is documented and public, and I'm of course available for questions. To the point of questions. low on time. Sorry. So, uh, we have time for a few questions. So um, who's interested? Who wants to start? How did you get the Mozilla folks to accept patches for OpenBSD at all? Um, at many years ago, I tried doing that. And I was told we're interested in Linux, Windows, Mac OS, and the rest of you, we don't want your patches in our repo. Um, I think uh, it was just a matter of opening bugs and uh, making sure that the patch you are feeding back don't break anything, of course. But since it's not part of the supported architectures, most of the time they don't really care because they are trained to be friendly, honestly. Um, and it's just a matter of getting to have people know you, that you are here and you, OK, I have 100 patches and I have to feed back them. But first, that meant I had to understand them, why they were here. Because if you feed back the patch, you have to explain, OK, I have this patch, take it. That doesn't work. You just have to understand why it is here. So I just add the CVS log, which doesn't help a lot most of the time. Uh, I removed lots of patches, which actually were totally useless. I tried to remove all the patches, which were customizations. I prefer having the defaults that upstream provides and try to stay away from customizations. Because uh, when you report stuff upstream, they prefer having the default options and configurations. Uh, it was true some years ago. Now, since I have a bit less time, sometimes it acts removing some stuff. I don't like it. But they are really welcoming patches. It, I think it all depends on the way you feedback them and you have to go through Bugzilla and find someone to review them. So now they are welcoming, they are much more uh, open to, well, they have, they have always been open to contributions, but now they are trying to welcome new contributors and uh, giving an easy path to feedback patches and to find the reviewer. Um, for me, it's not an issue since I know most of the people where in which area they are working, but now there are something which is suggesting a reviewer based on the paths that are in your patch so that it's in this code, uh, code area so that the people responsible for this code area are uh, those possible reviewers. So that's part of the, the way of dealing with And six years ago, it, I think it was less people to do uh, a lot. Actually, I think the biggest problem a couple of years ago was they expected you to find out who's responsible for reviewing something and not providing any help with that. But uh, but at, uh, at that time, there was only a wiki page listing pe people names and the code area, which worked, but wasn't that easy. And going to IRC and asking people is the best way of finding the right person. No, in that case, thank you for the talk. Thank you.